Great. So uh, thanks, Will. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Data Visualization DC for having me. Um, you know, today I'm going to talk about Streamlit, um, where we'll turn your Python scripts into beautiful data apps. And so as has been mentioned, my name is Randy. Uh, I'm head of developer relations at Streamlit. If you've interacted with Streamlit via our forum, Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, uh, any number of places, you probably interacted with uh, either me uh, or one of my teammates. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about the, the high level design principles of Streamlit. Um, I'm not going to spend actually a ton of time showing demos. Uh, both Banjo and Will uh, have demos that um, you know I'd like to let them display. Um, but really, you know, I want to to make sure that you know when you walk away, you understand kind of how Streamlit works, um, why we've designed things the way we have, um, and, and kind of take it from there. And so my presentation is broken into three parts, as I alluded to. We're not really going to do part three. Um, we're going to save time, you know, for Banjo and, and for Will. Um, so what is Streamlit? And so when we think about data science or, or analytics or just, you know, development in general, um, you know, it's often romanticized that you write, you know, some bit of code and then, you know, maybe you submit it to a GPU cluster or, you know, giant computer or something and then just magic happens right there's no nobody talks about kind of the the intermediate steps but you know in reality you know there's a lot of steps in the data science workflow and there's a lot of tools you know that are required across those different steps and so depending on whether you're talking about uh doing data cleaning or uh presentation you know you might be writing SQL or you know writing Python. Uh, maybe there's Excel spreadsheets involved. Uh, you know you may want to uh, do different presentations for different groups. And so you know th these red boxes here kind of highlight that it's it's not one size fits all. You know there aren't really tools out there that are going to do everything you need for data science. And the, the thing about building a, a data app for presentation is that, you know, building data apps can be slow and expensive. You know, when you're talking about, you know, even the simplest data app, you, you have maybe one, two, you know, several different workflows for development. And so the, the first one, as you can see, is, is that the data scientists itself, themselves, you know, build the app. And, you know, this is kind of how things have been working. Uh, you know, every once in a while you find someone who's, you know, not only good at, you know, Python, but JavaScript, or, you know, maybe they're good at R or, you know, Scala, and who, who knows what, what, you know, data science you know, language they're using. And so, you know, you build your app, you, you explore in your Jupyter Notebook, you copy and paste into Python script, you know, on the Python, if you're using Python, you know, Python, you, you can use Flask, you use Django. Uh, there's a couple lesser known ones. Um, and you fall into, I, I think, what we call the unmaintainability trap. And, you know, the issue with this is that, you know, the data scientist who builds the app originally, one, it's not really their job necessarily to maintain production apps. And two, you know, they may not be front end or web development specialists. And so they may build a prototype that works, but then, you know, your pointy haired boss comes through and says, well, you know, it'd be great if you had one more chart right here. Well, then the question becomes, well, who adds that chart? You know, can I make this app look right? Can I make it work right? Will it be performance? And so, you know, the, the first workflow would be like the data scientists themselves, you know, also doing their, their um, you know, creating their data app. You know, the second workflow is, you know, perhaps there's a tools team to build the app. And so if you've worked at larger corporations um, that, that kind of cleanly split out people doing research and analytics, people doing, you know, DevOps, people doing, um, you know, front end or visualization work, you know, workflow two, you know, starts off with, with the project manager, you know, collecting requirements. Already, this is going to be slow. 
you know, then, then somebody does a mock-up, you know, you have your wireframes, people, you know, go back and forth, you know, hey, wouldn't it be nice if it looked like, you know, I don't know, some other app they've seen. Wouldn't it be great if it was an iOS app? You know, all, all those sort of weird conversations happen. You know, the third step, you, you actually code this thing. And then you get into, you know, what we call the frozen zone. So, you know, th this project will usually have a, a scope. It will have a budget. You'll have, you know, a certain amount of time allocated for the different people. But then what happens when you want to make a change, right? You get the situation where like, well, that, that front end team is no longer assigned to you. You know, the, they may have coded it in something you don't understand as the data scientist. You know, the DevOps people may not give you uh, access to push different apps. And so you get into the situation where your app becomes stagnant and it's only kind of useful for, you know, a short period of time. And so because the, cost, whether it's, it's monetary cost or people cost or time cost is so high, people aren't creating the amount of, they're only creating a fraction of the, the apps that could actually be useful um, to explain their project. And so that's where Streamlit comes in. The Streamlit framework allows you to build um, elegant data apps in hours, you know, perhaps minutes, depending on how fast you are. Um, you know, cutting that time down from weeks or months down to a day or, or, or even shorter. And our goal is that you will add minimal code um, to an existing Python script, generate a really powerful data app uh, without requiring you to know any front end development skills. And it, it really is incredibly easy and fast um, in terms of how you can build an app. And so on the screen here we have <clears throat> excuse me we have a machine learning app um, that identifies different objects in the screen and this app for for self-driving cars uh, is on our github repo and what's amazing is that this entire app so not only the machine learning piece but the visualization piece is roughly 300 lines of code and only 23 of those lines are actually streamlit calls. And so you can set up all of these interactive components. You can have multiple pictures on top of one another, updating, um, and it only took you know, roughly uh, two dozen streamlit calls. And so streamlit's open source. You know, we're, we're, we're really intentionally um, targeting um, you know, data scientists, data apps for now. Uh, we are trying to move more general um, but we never want to lose sight of the fact um, that we want to be an easy to use and rapid way for, for people to build the data apps that they want. And so stream that works on three principles um, and I'll go through each of them separately. And so the first one is, is embracing Python scripting. And so, you know, there's certainly Streamlit has, has numerous, uh, competitors, depending on how you look at it, other open source projects um, that have different uh, goals. And so, you know, what we want to, uh, we want Streamlit to be is very declarative in nature. We don't want to bring the front end or the web development paradigm to Streamlit. We want it to be as Python-like as, as uh, writing a Python script. And so you can see in this example here, um, we have a st.write call. And this is basically declaring a piece of, of markdown uh, to show up in the app. And then you, know, you can do uh, the pandas, do a read CSV, and then declare a line chart and it just shows up. You can see there's no callbacks here. You don't have to say where you know, the, this output's gonna go. You know, it's really just a matter of adding a handful of calls, seeing um, what the app looks like on, on the, the Streamlit front end in the browser, and then from there, you know, tweaking things to, to kind of get the result that you're looking for. The second principle that we work on, or, or that we were designed on, is to treat widgets as variables. And so I mentioned before about callbacks. Um, if you've ever done this in JavaScript, um, callbacks are what give you the ability 
uh, along with JavaScript to have really intense functionality, really interactive, um, really interactive data. But it can be very confusing to try and trace through that mentally of saying, you know, this piece moves this, and then somewhere on a different page, you know, there's a listener that's looking for these data elements. What we are doing with Streamlit is the widgets themselves return a Python variable. And so for the example here with the, the widget slider, as you select a number, that number is actually passed back as a Python variable. And so in this case, uh, the variable X is set to the value of the slider. And so this works just like any other Python variable where you can now pass that to another Python function and then use that data. And so, you know, in this example, you can see the st.write, very simple, you selected and then the X variable. And so you see that on the screen, as you move the slider, that value gets passed to the Python code, passed to the stream of the code, and immediately, you know, displays that value. And so we think this, this greatly simplifies building interactive widgets, whether it's sliders, drop down menus, multi select boxes. You know, the fact that we return the data as a Python variable instead of requiring um, very complex callback logic, again, you know, greatly simplifies uh, and, and magnifies what people can do uh, in a very short time. And then the third. Um, the third principle that we have that we built Streetland on uh, is reusing data and computation. And so this one is a little bit uh, subtle, a little bit more advanced. Um, Streamlit runs top to bottom. Um, this is one of the um, things that makes Streamlit so easy. If you're thinking about your code, you can reason about it by looking at the top and saying, okay, this will process before this, this will process before this. Again, callbacks, in, in JavaScript or front-end development uh, are the antithesis of that. You have no idea necessarily when one thing is going to change another um, because it's all going asynchronously. The problem with, or the trade-off with running top to bottom is every time you interact with the Streamlit app, you're starting over, you're going from the top to the bottom. And so the way we um, have approached that is, is through a caching mechanism. And so, in Streamlit, you only need to run a computation once and then you can cache that based on the inputs to, to a function. And you know, if you've ever studied computer science, uh, this is exactly just uh, memoization um, where the inputs of one function and the outputs of one function are known. And so you can hash the inputs and then you can return the outputs. And so you can think of an expensive uh, operation like loading data. You know, perhaps it takes five seconds to load um, your data from a CSV. Every time you touch the Streamlit app, you don't want to keep having a five second delay. And so the first time that the, the app is run, uh, you necessarily have to have a five second delay. There's no way kind of around the, the, the cold start problem there. But if you cache that data load, from then on, we'll just return the, the value from RAM. And so we'll skip that five second data load. And so that's how you can build up um, really interactive, really fluid uh, capabilities within Streamlit, even though we still have the, the top, down, um, top down processing model. And so briefly, that's what Streamlit is. Again, we're trying to approach the, the question of how easy can we make it to build data apps, okay? And so in the second part about installing Streamlit, getting started with Streamlit is literally as easy uh, as running these two statements. And so um, if you haven't experienced Streamlit yet, I would highly encourage you um, create a virtual environment. Um, Streamlit now is a, a Python 3 only uh, library. Uh, create a virtual environment with Python 3 in it. Uh, then pip install Streamlit. Uh, that in itself will, will install all of the dependencies. Um, there really aren't that many. Um, we do some uh, trickery to support things without importing them. Um, and so you do your pip install and then within that virtual environment, uh, if you run Streamlit hello, 
um, that will bring up a demo um, that, that shows off uh, the streamlet functionality. And so um, I'm actually going to skip the live demo because I want to give you know plenty of time for for Banjo and Will. Um, you know, I highly recommend if you've never used Streamlit before, you know, even if you have used Streamlit before, um, there's a lot of great practices that are wrapped up in those four demos. Um, we show how to, um, you know, interactively build sliders, how to do animations, how to have continuously updating charts. You know, if you think about like a, a streaming data series, um, there's a, a deck GL example uh, for geospatial. And so, if you've never used Streamlit before, that's a great place to start. Um, we have a lot of, uh, of great examples there. And you know, if you haven't used Streamlit before, but you haven't checked out Streamlit Hello, maybe you'll learn something. Um, maybe you'll kind of see a trick that you haven't done before. And let's build a data app. OK, so I, I did a strike through here. Um, you know, Literally right before this started, we had a chat about you know the the different presenters tonight. Um, rather than do live coding and kind of bore everybody, um, you know, last month I gave a talk um, where I did do live coding. Uh, I believe it was recorded. I don't have the link here, um, but I'll post this link in the chat so that everybody can can clone this Git repo if they want. Uh, and it has two example Streamlit apps in it, and so. Uh, the one on the left um, just shows you how to interact with sliders, how to pass the values between different places, uh, how to set up uh, caching, how to see that caching is working, um, and just some really you know, basic uh, things uh, for your first Streamlit app. The one on the right uh, that's labeled Streamlit Folium is actually a custom component uh, that I created. Um, starting with version 63, of Streamlit, um, which I believe came out in mid-July. Um, Streamlit is now supported um, both what we call static and bi-directional communication um, with, with the JavaScript front end. And so you can take um, pretty much any JavaScript library that exists and now set it up so that you can pass data from Streamlit and Python to uh, the JavaScript library. And then you know, optionally, you can return data back. And so this uh, demo shows uh, something I built for the Folium library, which is a Python library that wraps um, leaflet.js, a, a mapping library. And so you know, these two examples um, you know, can definitely get you pretty far. If there's a library that you wish was supported in Streamlit but isn't, uh, the components framework is a great way to get started. Um, and so again, I'm gonna skip these in, in the service of time. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, copy this link in, into the chat so that people can clone it if, if they want to kind of go over those demos. And then the last thing is really, uh, you know, try it out and let us know what you think. One of the best parts of my job uh, interacting with the community is just understanding what people are trying to do, um, work through their problems with them, you know, get them unblocked, and then, you know, make them the hero at work or you know, publish a, a great analysis, you know, on your favorite kind of pet topic. Um, and so, you know, these three links are, are a great way to find out more information. So of course, the first one's our corporate website, um, streamlit.io. Uh, we'll tell you about Streamlit the company. Um, it can be confusing at times. There is Streamlit a company and there's Streamlit an open source package. Uh, the people that work at Streamlit the company work on Streamlit the package. Um, but we are not solely an open source Python library, or that's not what we plan to do in the future. Um, if you want to meet and, and interact with people like me or other people in the community, I um, mean, come to our, our uh, forum. And so discuss.streamlit.io. Uh, this is a great place to get feedback about your projects. If you're stuck about something, post a code snippet, you know, whether it's me, someone else in Streamlit, someone else in the community, uh, we'll get you unstuck. Um, see an interesting project, you know, share with the community, have deployment questions, you know, it, it's all best handled on our forum. And then finally, if, if, if you really just want to jump in and kind of get started, um, all of our documentation is at docs.streamlit.io. Um, you know, that's somewhat self-explanatory, but 
Um, if, again, if you want to just, you know, kind of hurry up and get started, um, you know, check out our documentation. Um, with all three of these links, you know, we're also really open to feedback. And so if there's something, you know, that you wish you saw in the documentation, please leave a GitHub issue. Um, some perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, no matter how you go through each of these three, uh, the, the result will actually come to me. So uh, if you have a documentation request, uh, do it on uh, GitHub. Um, if you have a suggestion, do it on the forum. Uh, at some point I will see it and uh, try and uh, implement it. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Banjo. Um, or actually, I don't know if we're gonna do questions right now, Will, or? Yeah, let's let's do a, let's do a couple of questions. If anyone has questions, uh, feel free to post them in the Q and A. Uh, we can answer answer those live. Um, I guess, uh, Randy, I, I'd love to, love to actually hear you talk a little bit more about what the near future looks like for both Streamlit the company and Streamlit the project. Because um, I know you, you've got the company has gotten a, um, some some venture funding, which should really accelerate the development. So that's very exciting. Yeah, that's that's a, a great great lead in. So yeah, we, you know we've raised uh, a bunch of money in our Series A. Um, it's really to, as you say, accelerate the growth. And so we we are on a hiring spree. I guess I could have said this before, but uh, I'm actually hiring for my team. Um, if you're interested, uh, there is a uh, developer advocate role um, to work on my team. Go to streamlit.io. I think slash careers. Um, you should be able to find it. Um, we actually do have some back-end engineer and front-end engineer positions as well. And so, yeah, part of the, the um, you know, the, that fundraising um, was really, you know, to help us accelerate the development of Streamlit, uh, the open source project. Um, secondarily, you know, on the commercial side, um, later on this year, we're, we're looking to release a project that's tentatively called Streamlit for Teams. Streamlit for Teams is kind of the second part of the story. And so if you think about Streamlit, the open source project is trying to make it really easy to create a data app. Streamlit for Teams is going to make it really easy to push that app to production. And so, you know, we're hoping to get to the point where it's, it's a one click deployment of a Streamlit app. You build it locally on your machine, you launch it on, on Streamlit for Teams. Um, one of the, great features uh, that we're gonna come out with um, is there is gonna be a free tier. So we're actually gonna launch the free tier first and then move um, to a more enterprise level tier. And so, you know, for some smaller, you know, app, you know, or, you know, for everybody who, you know, creates their first Streamlit app and wants to show it off, you know, an interesting, you know, open data set or something like that, you know, we're providing, um, you know, a free tier for people to do that. Um, but as more enterprisey features kind of arise where people want to either keep their repos private or they want to keep their data private, um, they want, you know, authentication or, you know, those sorts of things that are more enterprise in nature. Um, that's what we're also building, um, which will be in our enterprise tier. And so, you know, the money we've raised is, is really, again, just hiring as many engineers as we can uh, to, to go as fast as we can to kind of grow the stream of community. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think um, unless there are any other immediate questions, uh, I think let's uh, switch over to Banjo to actually demonstrate an application. And then I think we'll have a few minutes at the end for you know, some additional discussion and questions. So if people have questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A and we'll make sure that Randy addresses those. Great. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thank you, Randy. Banjo, you ready? Yep. All right, stage is yours. All righty. <clears throat> Does everyone see my screen? Hello? See my screen? No? All right, cool. So I uh, didn't prepare any slide. I was going to kind of just walk through some stuff I've been doing. Uh, so one project I've been working on uh, before Streamlit was out was called Grimoire. The idea behind it was the take a bunch of data apps and then show them in a nice way. But I was really struggling with like, okay, I can take a bunch of data and like throw it in a pandas data frame and have an API show stuff, but how can I 
how can I visualize like what you're doing behind the scenes? And I was kind of stuck with that until I saw a random blog post about Streamer. But oh, this is pretty cool. I can actually just put this ST write statement and I can render all the cool stuff I've been trying to do behind the scenes. So I really kind of took that, uh, a lot of the stuff Brandon that showed us about how you can easily just embed Python scripts you already have and just put a couple of things into that and voila, you see all these cool interactive plots right here. So heat maps, pair plots, uh, all sorts of cool things. So let me uh, walk through it. So the idea behind it was like uh, Grimoire was like the, the Wix of data analysis. You can quickly run predefined workflows without creating any of your code. So all the, so Stream just released this concept called uh, components. They weren't released previously. So I did a bunch of like component like code the, behind the scenes. So the idea was I can just, oh, I want to do data cleaning. I'll add that. And then this is running the stream on the side. And then I can do a bunch of cool pre-built things I have. So I want to do a UMAC production. And then I mentioned that cold start. So it takes a while to do some machine learning tasks, but the idea is I'll be able to, to run that in the background. And then cool, I have a UMAP reduction of data from Iris dataset. And then say, I want to run a classifier as well. So I'll add that code as well. Uh, so there's a concept of ST cache, or that went much more, much more quicker this time because the data was already cached. So mention that cold start. And then this is, uh, I'm using a thing called yellow brick. I think they presented at one of this meetup before, but basically, so I haven't done any code right now. All I've done, I've put a CSV file. I was able to do a UMAP reduction and then I have a yellow brick classifier, train a model, give me the output results. And then if I even wanted to, I can actually put in values and then make a prediction. So it's pretty cool that kind of stream that kind of all this stuff's happening in the background and I can kind of just add, play, add and remove as I want. And I've done a bunch of components. You can add histograms, bar graphs, try to do things like even like fast tech classification, uh, maps. So I really like the flexibility stream that gives you to kind of create these components and add them to your, to your system. Uh, and then let's see. Uh, demo. So in this app, I created some way to kind of save these grimoires. Uh, when you think of a grimoire, in this case, the, each of these is a spell. So I think grimoire is black magic, and we always think of data science as black magic. It's crazy what's going on. So I thought it was cute. Uh, the idea behind it is after you create your grimoire, you can cast your spell. So I just made this demo one. Uh, let's see. Whoa. Yeah, that's what I wanted. So the idea uh, I did for this is basically a streamlet has a way that you can natively upload CSVs, but I've also I've done ways where you can just put the URL and then it will just do that, do everything for you already. So basically I pin in the URL, I put all my predefined things. Uh, we hear this is an error happened because I'm trying to do a continuous label. I'm trying to do a classifier on a, on a not on like a, integer, so I need to change the species. I said update. Uh, I want to do species, right? Target for the model species, and then boom, same thing. So this is really a, a way to kind of bootstrap data engineering and having an app to sit in a, in a single singular process. So I think this was a pretty cool thing, and this wouldn't be possible without Streamlit. Like if that didn't have Streamlit, like I guess imagine all the crazy JavaScript you'd have to write and back and forth and API. There would just been a kind of the unmaintain, unmaintainable trap. So this really simplified that process and you can have apps up and running and add all sorts of logic. Uh, this is open source, so you can go to the, the GitHub repo. Uh, let's see, classifier pi. So basically see that SD cache, making sure that the model is loaded. It saves a pickle file train the model. So kind of all those steps that are running. Uh, I just, the idea behind uh, Grimoire was basically 
put a bunch of these spells together and then run them in a sequential workflow order. Uh, Brandy mentioned that everything goes top to bottom. So in this, when you kind of go back here, we see top to bottom. So it's running all these steps top to bottom and each of these are an individual component. And this was a really awesome way because a lot of the times in data science, you just want to kind of get an initial modeling or show something to a crowd. And I really like the idea of just have, plugging in data and then running your back end. Because a lot of the times when I open up a notebook, I'm like, oh, pandas, read CSV, do this, and run a bunch of stuff. And it's kind of hard to demo that to like a non-technical crowd. So this really helped streamline that process. Uh, I don't know if you can see this URL, but I'll, I'll post them afterward. But basically, it's online. It's a, online demo you can try on a very small EC2 instance, so not everybody go at once, but the, you can download it. Uh, very simple, you clone it, you run a script and it starts up everything. So that was kind of my first project of using Streamlib getting of these components. And then my second project was basically, uh, so in kind of with the same no substream that I've, I've read a lot of blog posts and write a lot of blog posts. And one thing that I, I see a, a lot in the blogs, it's kind of like this static image problem. You see like this guy, this, he's, this article is about how to use pandas or something of that nature. And he's showing here's a cool, here's a data frame and it's a very static image. Another thing, here's a static image of a, a line graph. I can't really interact with it. And I see this all the time in blogs and on towards data science. I'm sure many of you have read, read articles from here a lot of static images and my frustration is kind of like, I wish there was a way to be more interactive with all these data science articles. A lot of people writing data science articles, it's just static images, like it's re really hard to interact. So with the idea of Streamlit, I created this from Grimoire and created something called Grimoire Blogs. So it's basically an interactive blogging platform that allows you to embed data, graphs, and API for any coding. So I call it, it's like WordPress for data scientists. So basically, kind of what I just showed in Streamly, you kind of put in those, that CSV interactive graph right away, hover over it, I can change things. Embed APIs, like this is just a random number API, I call it, gives you a random number. And you can change the variables, uh, you want five. And Streamlit is pretty cool because basically this is just an iframe that has a Streamlit app. So it's very easy to kind of embed it in, already into websites. Uh, so how this works is basically, go right to story. Uh, so Streamlit already natively supports Markdown. So all the text is in Markdown, but then I have these special grimoire objects embedded in the Markdown to say, I want to show an image or I want to show uh, a CSV. So basically you just use pure markdown and then there's like these little drop downs that you can say, I want to add a, I want to add a graph or I want to add a map. And then you put the URL and kind of add in the fields you want. So when you preview it, basically it renders to like a nice stream of application. So you have the highlighting uh, of the max. Let's do highlight heat map. Oops. So this is using Pandas uh, display filters. So uh, Streamlit already has documentation on how to do that. So heat maps one of them. So the max values, etc., which is pretty cool. Uh, interactive graph. These are built with Altair. Uh, Streamlit has a lot of supports a lot of graphs. So Matplotlib, Altair, Bokeh, a lot of them. And then the documentation is pretty good. It, it lays out how to e put each of these. What I really like is you can kind of just say, I want to change how my data looks like. So instead of going to that static graph over here, I can kind of like actually play around, see what's going on, explore the data myself, change variables. <coughs> um, this is for different type of graphs. So that's, I really like this interactive. I can make it bigger. So that's really the, the big value add is I'm a data scientist. I want to show off my data. I want people to explore it. I don't want a static image that's displaying all this cool things I want to do. And I don't want to have to go in to a notebook, save a, a matplotlib file somewhere, upload it somewhere. All I need is a CSV in my GitHub repo and then I can automatically create these without having to think of that. So it's really, you mentioned speed before, we really want to kind of 
show off our data, show what's, and let people play around a bit. Uh, iframes is another thing I mentioned. I've already displayed iframes, so if you want to show a cool site you made in your blog post already, you can just display an iframe. Um, Markdown supported, so that's standard. API, this is a big one. I really like uh, being able to just play or so I showed how that model could be changed. You can kind of just add, add APIs directly into your blog post and it's really awesome and that you can just do that and call functions right there. Uh, map, so this is the Folium uh, map that Randy actually built. And it's funny because I actually was trying to use this and I was having an issue on mobile that the, the width was always the same. I had to find a clever solution to, so to make the width the same. And I, I posted a GitHub comment and Randy responded to it. So it's cool to meet him. <laughs> but this is very useful. Uh, the, the original streamlit map icon actually didn't let the floating markers work. So the folium really helped. So you can actually see what the data is. So this is a, a map, I believe, of COVID data. And you can kind of just see hover over uh, states and all the data already there. Instead of just having to read a big CSV or something, you can actually explore the data yourself. So that's, and this is live now. So if anybody's a blogger and wants to try things out, you can go to uh, www.grimoireblogs.com. That's sign in for your Twitter, GitHub, write blogs, post things. It's pretty cool. Uh, let's see. I guess this is just my information if anyone wants to try things out or uh, have any questions for me. Uh, yeah, Banjo. I don't see the chat, so you're gonna have to read the questions for me. Yep, I don't think we have any questions in the Q&A at this time, but that is that is super cool. Um, I, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about how hard it was to embed Streamlit you know, in this tool. Oh, yeah. For so Streamlit's really working in, as, as the blog layer. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the cool, so this, the so behind everything else, uh, it's basically, I mean, using like a Flask application served on a serverless architecture. And then Streamlit's basically, if I want to actually display the blog, go to this URL and embed the Streamlit uh, application. So, so if this is an iframe that's pointing to a Streamlit application and one of the new features in Streamlit that was recently released was this experimental uh, field to take in a key value and then render that. So prior to that, it was very hard to like have dynamic applications, but this new feature that Streamlit uh, launched in their experimental, I guess, namespace, which is basically, it's not in their, I guess, main, like tested very well yet, but it's like an up and coming thing people want to try. With that experimental uh, namespace, I was able to basically each URL I'm passing in, it has like a key equals one or like key equals my blog post. And then it all the data in Markdown is saved in a database and it's rendered into the streamlet. So I basically have a bunch of code that's reading in that information. So I can show you like an example. Uh, let's see. Let's do the SVM classifier. It basically can read in that information and then take and just run the streamlit code. So have like this concept of spell inputs, take the inputs, take what's there and then display the information as you need. So you put in the ST write, show raw data, whatever. So basically it's taking in those inputs and then I have code that's rendering what could be shown to the user and then having different keys for what data to load is, is really the lifesaver without the experimental feature to load on keys, like this wouldn't work at all. So I think that was before I was doing some weird hack to kind of mess with the tornado, get the settings and that didn't work at scale, but this new way with the, with the key, like really streamlined this very easily. That's super cool. Let me post the links in the chat. And it's very cool. Again, if people have uh, any questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A. Um, 
Banjo, unless there's anything else you want to mention here, I think I've, I've got a, a pair of quick demos that, that I can go through. Yep. I'll, I'll just throw out Banjo. This is really, really awesome. I, I found your stuff on the Streamlight forums. Oh, yeah. and I was actually sending you, I sent you some feedback and we were like talking about it. It's funny. I didn't realize it was you until right now when you showed it. So that's a oh, yeah, small yeah. world here. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, your feedback was very helpful and I've incorporated some of your changes. So thank you for that. Oh, you did the hard work. I just yeah, <laughs> said, here's ideas. Cool. Yep. It's great, great how small a world it is. Yeah, all right. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, can everyone see my desktop now? Cool. Yeah, we see it. Yep, I'm going to go ahead and reload the Streamlit application. So I did a project um, about a year and a half ago when Google released their Google Takeout history. Um, where And so there, if you have a Google account, you can go and download all of your personal data that Google has. And so I, I did that actually uh, just yesterday. And actually in about an hour earlier today. So I built this app in about an hour. And it's the I think at this point, second or third st full Streamlit app that I've built. Um, and it imports the, uh, the, str the location data from Google. And this is like my personal location data for the last six and a half, seven years uh, based on my phone. If you have an Android phone or use Google Maps, Google is getting your location data. Um, but this is a little, little Streamlit app to show off some of that. Um, and so you've got, you can see the data frame and this is uh, 630,000, almost 630,000 rows of data. Uh, that's just from you know, six and a half, seven years of Google. So Streamlit has built in uh, some built-in visualization options, including bar charts, which are very nicely interactive. Um, so you can actually go in and zoom. And this is the um, a grouping of the of the location data by velocity. Uh, so you can see that for the most part, most of the most of the location traces that Google has from me, my velocity is zero. Zero meters per second, not going anywhere. And that one one meter per second is the next most common. Then you can see that there are a couple, uh, you know, it gets progressively faster. Uh, some of this is probably driving, uh, you know, 60, 60, 70, uh, or sorry, this is a 20, 20, 25 meters per second. That's pretty fast. There are a couple of faster ones. For example, like 50 meters per second. That, that's quite fast. And if I reset this, you'll notice it goes out to about 160 meters per second. And so we should be able to see that there is a single data point at 147 meters per second. Now that's, that's really fast. That's like 300 something miles per hour. I don't drive that fast. I've never been in a car that has driven that fast. So I made a data frame here that's just the, the data frames that have some velocity. And the default uh, data frame printing in Streamlit allows you to, it has some interactivity so you can sort. And so here we can see that there are a couple of, oops, a couple of very fast location traces, all of which were at relatively high altitude. Uh, 2,600 2, meters is quite high. So I was probably in a plane at that point. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how it got the data points in airplane mode, but it did. Um, you can also see uh, the data points, the location traces grouped by altitude. And you can see that for the most part, there's a lot of it around zero and pretty low altitudes, but there are a few data points where there were some higher altitude location traces. I've also got one of location accuracy uh, and so the, here you can see what the accuracy of each trace is. So for example, there were 600, uh, not, there were 9,000 location traces that were accurate to 600 meters. Now you'll know, one of the things that's interesting here is for a lot of the, these values, it's you know, very organic curves, but for some of them, there are spikes around round numbers. So for example, 300, there are a lot more values, a lot more location traces that were had 300 meters of accuracy as compared to 280. So one, at least one of the devices that I own was rounding 
the location accuracy to the nearest 100 meter increment, which I thought was very interesting. You can see that continuously, a lot of things at like 18, 1899. So quite, quite interesting to see that. Um, you can also do a line chart. This is basically the same thing, but just using the line chart instead. And it's got vertical accuracy. And so here, a lot of, a lot of location traces that were, were accurate to within 10 meters vertically. A uh, couple of outliers there. So yeah, so it turns out that Google collects a lot of data and Streamlit is a very quick way to build interactive apps to visualize that. And again, I, I built this in about an hour earlier today. So Streamlit, I would not have been able to do that in any other frame, framework. So I have a second quick demo. Um, and this one is basically just a fun note to end on. So Streamlit has a fun little, basically Easter egg feature uh, called balloons. And I'm actually gonna uh, pull, pull up the code for that. Um, and it's just streamlit.balloons. And it makes balloons, fun emoji balloons. Uh, and you can loop the, uh, you can call it that func function from just about anywhere. So for example, you can loop it. Uh, and this is an interactive slider. The slider is just you know, one, one line of code here, which you can turn off word wrap. So one line of code gets an interactive slider that provides variables and you can just loop through balloons. It just keeps going for a bit. All the way up to 100 balloons. I could make this arbitrarily large, but that would be, that would be quite silly. So yeah, that's a, uh, I think that is one of the, the fun little Easter eggs in Streamlit, but overall there are so many awesome features that it doesn't really need Easter eggs like this. So yeah, and uh, the other thing that I'll mention about the previous Streamlit application, the first one I showed, is that it's 30 lines of code in total, including white space, all the titles, um, comments and things like that. So this was about 30 lines of code and about an hour, which I was pretty pretty pleased with how it turned out and very impressed by Streamlit. Um, any comments or questions? <laughs> uh, 300 mile, we had a question from Nate, who was our awesome presenter last week. Uh, 300 miles per hour, maybe you threw your phone from a roller coaster. I've dropped my phone out of windows, but never off a roller coaster. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I think we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, if there are any other questions in the, let's see, any other questions in the chat or any other comments? Hmm. It looks like uh, Michael had an excellent question about um, basically linking selections between charts, uh, to which Randy, Randy had, I think, a good answer in the text. Uh, Randy, do you, do you want to address that live? Sure. Michael asked if, if you could link uh, charts together. And the answer, uh, the always unsatisfactory answer is yes and no. Um, and so widgets don't communicate between themselves at the JavaScript level. Um, but as you know, several people talked about, um, the fact that you can return values via Python uh, can have this effect. And so um, like with Banjo's example with Folium, it is possible for someone to implement um, returning the bounding box back to Python. And then you could use that bounding box to filter uh, you know, your geospatial data set. And so um, there are ways to do this thing, um, but as a security precaution right now, as we figure out um, how people want to use components, um, we were very strict that the um, widgets can't communicate between themselves. Um, because if they could, you know, one, one package developer could start changing the results of, of other people's widgets. And we, we just wanted to make sure that, you know, that didn't happen at launch. Yeah, that makes sense. Though I, I will say that it is 
while it's certainly possible to get that interactivity in JavaScript, it's still also very hard in JavaScript to get that. Like there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of fiddly details. Oh, all right, very cool. Um, I think, um, yeah, any, any other closing, uh, I guess, closing comments or discussion? And uh, Banjo, what is what is uh, next on your roadmap for Grimoire? So right now you can only uh, upload images via a URL on the blog. So having the ability to uh, upload your own images, uh, that's, that's a big thing. People like to upload their own images on everything. So really about quality of life improvements. Really want it to be a easy to use blogging platform. So going to focus on quality of life, uh, some tutorials, and put some example content. I think really flushing out that uh, frictionless onboarding experience. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on next. The Streamlit has a lot of updates, so, and they're making new components. So as those come available, I'd like to incorporate them as well. Very cool. Actually, I then have a follow-up question for Randy. So Randy, Streamlit is in very active development right now and is, like you said, beginning to go in, you know, that pace of development is accelerating. So there's a lot of, a lot of exciting improvements being made. Could you talk a little bit more about, you know, how, especially how companies should evaluate Streamlit right now? Because many organizations have, or are, not interested in embracing experimental technology that's still being rapidly improved that might have breaking changes. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that in terms of what we can expect in turn for Streamlit in terms of stability as you move towards a, a full 1.0 release. Sure. Um, that's sort of a complicated question. I mean, obviously when you're talking about open source software, um, you know, it's a different level of kind of interaction, support, and, and things of that nature. And so the one thing we, we've tried to, to maintain with Streamlit is uh, declaring when features are either experimental or beta. And so we try and put things that may or may not work out into experimental, which is really to declare like, hey, this is, we can't guarantee that this, is, this feature is gonna be added to Streamlit and we can't guarantee it's gonna actually have the same API. When it makes it to our beta designation, um, it's really just to find out that it, it has the functionality that other people are looking for. Um, it is expected to actually enter the code base. And then once it's actually uh, both experimental and beta are removed from the function names, um, the expectation is, is that there are gonna be stable. Um, we try not to deprecate keyword arguments that often. Um, you will see some of them from the early days of, of uh, Streamlit. Um, but we try and go out without having them, um, uh, without doing those sorts of deprecations. And so, you know, as, as companies are evaluating different things, I, I think it's important to realize that it, it depends on your use case. Um, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, we like to highlight that, you know, we have obviously there's projects that are, you know, competitors are competing. We don't necessarily um, subscribe to that, right? Flask is gonna be the right tool to use when it's the right tool to use. Or Django, you know, it's gonna be the right tool to use if you have to build, you know, an e-commerce site or, or, or something of that nature. And so to the extent that analysts or data scientists trying to create rapid prototypes, trying to sketch things out, um, we will eventually add things like uh, grid functionality um, that's coming in the coming months, maybe even weeks. Um, and so you'll start to see Streamlit having more features that people are requesting, uh, more layouts, you know, customization of, um, you know, whether it's dark themes or, or, you know, being able to customize at the CSS element level. You know, those things will eventually get added. And so 
you know, to companies that are looking to kind of evaluate this, the question is, is really, does Streamlit save you time? Does it save you development costs? Um, you know, does it get you what you need, right? You know, th there's kind of this, uh, you can kind of look at it from a spread of, you know, Excel macros, right? You know, sometimes, you know, people are trying to build user interfaces and spreadsheets, right? You know, is it better to use Streamlit for that? You know, do some of the other competing projects that are more DOM complete, you know, if you need those functions, you need those functions. And so it's really up to companies to, to think about what exactly it is they need. Uh, but from a st stability standpoint, uh, I wouldn't consider uh, Streamlit to be unstable. Um, we're essentially adding features. We're not, we're not kind of churning through the existing ones. Yeah, very, very well spoken tonight. Uh, I think re regardless of what some more corporate minded folks may think, I think I am, I, I'm pretty, pretty sold on the concept. Cool. Well, on that note, um, I think we're right at about seven o'clock. Um, if there are no other comments or questions or closing remarks, I think we should go ahead and call that a wrap. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Will. And everyone yeah. else from Dave DC. Yep, absolutely. Randy, thank you for joining us. Banjo, thank you for the excellent demo. Uh, Jeff, thank, thank, thank you in the Data Science DC side of the house for, for the support. You guys have some awesome events coming up as well. So yeah, stay tuned to you know, both groups at, uh, on meetup.com for Data Viz DC and Data Science DC. And uh, check out Streamlit at streamlit.io. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks everyone for attending. Great presentations.